Welcome to You Council. In our previous lectures, we had explained that there are multiple ways in which you can resolve a family law dispute, but should you need to go to a court in Ontario to have your family law matter resolved, this lecture explains some of the basic steps that you have to undergo to resolve your matter in the court system. Note that this lecture is not legal advice, so if you have any specific questions regarding your issues, you should contact a lawyer or a paralegal or the Law Society of Ontario for a referral. Now, family law rules are rules that deal with family law matters. They are quite similar to rules of civil procedure, but in many aspects they are different. So what you need to do is go through these family law rules to understand what is the process, what is the procedure for you obtaining, getting relief from the court, from the family courts. We have provided the link here, which uh, takes you to family court rules. They are available for free online. Now here is the process. First of all, you will have to bring an application in the court for whatever family law related relief that you're seeking, whether you're seeking divorce or custody issue or access issues or support issues, whatever the issue may be, you will have to complete an application and then have that application issued at the court. There are different forms for different kinds of applications. So you need to make sure that you are completing the correct form and then you are having you're having that form issued at the court. So you, you prepare the application, the right application, you take it to the court, you pay the appropriate fee for the issuance of that application. The court will take that application, keep a copy, put a court file number on it, stamp on it uh, the date of the issuance. And so then you know that then you are in the court system and you have a court file number and the application is issued. Once the application is issued, you have to serve a copy of that issued application on the respondent. This could be your ex-partner or, or the other party who you are taking to court with respect to this application. So that application needs to be served on that party. There are timelines during which you need to serve that application and there are processes by which you are required to serve that application. So it is important to understand the rules, how you are, you are required to serve that application. Once the application is served, then you have to file proof of service with the court. This confirms to the court by way of an affidavit that you have actually served the application. The application is now served on the respondent and now it is respondent's job to prepare an answer, serve it on you and file it with the court. So this step is for the respondent to prepare their answer within the time prescribed in the family law rules and then serve and serve it on you and then file it with the court. If the respondent has not filed its answer within the time frame, then at this stage, you will be able to proceed to default judgment against that respondent, and which is why it is important that the application is served properly. Otherwise, you won't be able to get the default relief. And for default relief, I think you can look at my lectures, which are under rules of civil procedure, but it will give you an understanding of how you obtain a default judgment uh, in the court process. So if the respondent is has indeed filed the response, so that means it's a contested uh, and it is a contested application, then the court will require both parties, you the applicant and the respondent to attend mandatory information program. Now these programs, uh, both parties are required to attend it separately, not at the same time, may not be at the same location, but it is it is a requirement of the process that you attend this mandatory information program. Once that is done, then the next stage in the process is case conference. This is before the judge. Both parties will attend with or without counsel. And the, the judge's role in that case conference is to figure out, understand what is the what are the issues um, in that particular application. Are there things that could be, are there issues that could be narrowed down? Are there issues that could be resolved? So it's just to get an overall sense of what the case is and, and, and resolve any issues that could uh, could be done by way of discussion, by way of some sort of order from, from, the, from the judge. Once the case conference is completed, both parties are, are required to um, produce certain documents to the other side. It could be financial disclosure or other documents relevant to that application. The applicant has to provide uh, its documents, copies of its documents to the respondent and vice versa. The respondent has to do the same. So that those will be the documents that both parties will rely on to pursue whatever remedy that they're seeking under in, in that application. 
So the production and discovery process does not have to be after the case conference. It is one of the steps that needs to be taken. It could have, uh, the production can take place shortly after the answer has been filed. And, and in the production, if there, you require further discovery of documents, and that is the stage that you, you go through, you may have questions about some of the documents from the other side, and you will be able to do that process from the discovery process, very similar to the process in the rules of civil procedure. If the matter is not settled, then there will be a settlement conference, as the name implies. This will be a time when the court will try. There will be a judge who will attend the settlement conference and will try to settle the case. If the entire case cannot be settled, if it can be um, part of it, a part of the case can be settled, then the judge will try to do that. But whatever could be done in terms of a mutual agreed resolution, the judge will try to do that. And if, if, if it doesn't result in any settlement of the case, then the next conference that parties will attend is called trial management conference. And as the name indicates, the conference is desired, is meant to deal with logistics of scheduling a trial. Now, even at trial management conference, the judge will once again try to see if the matter could be resolved. So the court's um, efforts are always there to see if parties can come to some sort of mutual resolution because if parties come to a resolution then it's a resolution that has been crafted by parties themselves and it is not something that is imposed by the court because that is what will happen if the matter goes to trial. So at trial management, the court will figure out if the matter could settle or part of the matter could settle. And if it doesn't, then the court will figure out when the trial will take place, for how many days, how many witnesses, all of these things will be determined at trial management conference so that when the trial takes place, it can take place within the time frame effectively and expeditiously. So if the matter is not settled at trial management conference, then of course we'll go to trial. And after the trial, the court, the judge will give an order with respect to the issues. And that is how the matter will conclusively resolve in the court system. Some of the tips that I have for you with respect to the court process, if you are filing your application in Ontario Court of Justice or Family Court, then the court clerk will provide you a date of first appearance. This is the first appearance where both parties will attend and the court, similar to sort of case conference, the, the, the both parties will attend and the court will prelim, have a preliminary view of the case um, and, then, and then deal with some of the basic issues that it need to deal with. If your application is filed at the Superior Court of Justice, then there is no first appearance, but you will have a case conference. Now, this case conference in Superior Court of Justice, the date, you will have to ask the court to provide you a date. It is not automatically provided by the court clerk. So what you want to do is when you file your application um, and have it issued at the Superior Court of Justice, I think that is the time I suggest that you should obtain a, a case conference date at the time of issuance. Why? Because the dates that the court will provide will be further down the line, uh, it, probably in three months, four months time, depending upon the court that you're at. And so you don't, if you want to expedite your process, uh, which I believe will be in your interest if you're the applicant, then you don't want to wait until the respondent has filed his or her answer and then you ask for case conference because then it will take another three months or four months for you to have the case conference. So it's a great idea to get the case conference at the outset of the application. And for some reason, if the respondent is not available on that date, you can always mutually agree to have another date scheduled for case conference. The court um, requires fees for, for filing of the application and certain other steps. And if your uh, personal circumstances uh, are such that you're not able to afford those fees, then remember that there is a process with the Ministry of Attorney General that you can fill out a form. Uh, you have to provide some sort of um, supporting documents for your income to indicate that you are not able to afford for court fees and then those fees could be waived. So remember that this option is there and if you need to seek for the waiver of the fees, you can apply for it. Once your application is issued, I would recommend that you serve it as soon as possible on the respondents. You have a certain time limit to serve the application anyways, but I but I believe that it will help you if you if you serve the application as soon as possible because once you serve the application, that is when the time clock really starts to tick on the respondent. Um, once you have served the application, the respondent, if it's uh, if he or she is in Canada or U.S., then they have 30 days to file their response, and if they're outside of Canada or U.S., then they have 60 days to file their response. So, if you delay you, the service of application, then this time clock, 30 or 60 days, will not 
uh, will not start. And so if you have a first appearance already scheduled or if you have a case conference already scheduled and you delay, delay the service to a point that the respondent does not have sufficient time before attending the case conference or the first appearance to serve and prepare and serve their response, then your first appearance or case conference is gonna get delayed invariably. So I think it makes sense for you to serve it as soon as possible. With respect to service, I suggest if you're able to afford it to use a process server for service of your documents, especially the application, because there are specific rules on how the application needs to be served and process servers are professional. That is what they do. Their job is to serve various documents, uh, core documents in various parties. So they know the process, they know what kind of affidavit of document needs to be prepared and whatnot. So if you're able to afford it, um, then I, I recommend that you do so through a process server. And also, um, they are neutral parties. They are not, um, you know, in some circumstances, the relationship may be acrimonious. And so you don't want to be uh, serving it uh, yourself or through your family member. So if you're able to use a process server, my recommendation is to use a process server. Remember that just because you have commenced an application in court does not mean that you have to wait for the court to resolve the entire matter. You can settle with the respondent with the other party at any stage in the court process. If you're not able to settle an entire matter, you can still agree on some of the issues, right? So for example, you may not agree on how the family uh, property is divided, but you can, if you're able to agree on access or custody issues, then you should, you should do that and agree on those issues. You can also obtain consent orders on various matters. So again, if, if, if parties are agreed that how the children may be accessed and, and how, you know, how their custody issues are dealt with and both parties are okay, then they can prepare a consent order and have the court approve that consent order. Also remember that you can bring a motion at any stage in this proceeding, with or without notice, depending upon the circumstances of your case. In, in fact, you can, if the circumstances are such, for example, if you're concerned about safety of children, and you can even bring a motion prior to the commencement of application because, because of the urgency of the issue that is there. So bringing a motion, you have that option at any stage, and if you need to bring a motion, then you can do so. So what you want to remember is that the process for family law disputes is designed to be fair and it's designed to be straightforward. That is why it is uh, it is slightly different than the rules of civil procedure because the court wants to, uh, wants even the self-represented litigants to understand the process easily and to follow it and to seek remedies. So it's important to, to read the family law rules and then look at the legislation that apply to your case, which I have provided in previous lectures, and see if you can obtain the relief that you are seeking. Thank you for watching.